what, what we're trying to do when we're having these discussions with people over time is we're trying to uncloud the fitter to work out what is it, why is this person not connecting with their creator and it's all about connection, you're absolutely right. That the thing you mentioned earlier, consciousness, where does it come from? I can't just accept that it's just accidental. It must be from somewhere. So the journey has to have an end, a goal. There has to be an end game. Would you be satisfied with the answer? I don't know. Because I can look at it from my, my perspective. The searching, the wondering, the fascination is very stimulating for me. Then I would suggest, humbly, that embark on this journey and accelerate on this journey yeah, with the intention to reach the goal. Similarities more than the differences, and I see some similarities. Some people might argue, because I would like to say that both of you believe in a creator. And you believe that the creator is responsible for our creation, and has given us free will. And if we follow the path of the Creator, then when we pass away, we will be with that Creator. I try and look at the similarities. I know there are a lot of differences. So, and the thing that the thing that I, I wanted to, to understand is is the notion of the fitra, because, like I said, I'm not a Muslim, as you know, and I'm not a Christian, but I believe in a Creator. So that kind of ties in with the belief that there's a fitra which that might be, I don't know, could be an instinctual thing that the, the creator has put in me or in my But the closest I've come to from doing research was when I came up with the fitra. And I wanted to know more from the fitra. If Allah puts the fitra in us, what then makes us stray away from Allah? Great, great question. Because if he put it there, so it should then just guide us all to just follow his path. So I, I don't know, uh, is it the free will that, that suppresses the fitra? Is the free will working against the fitra? Or is free will part of the fitra? Then that I thought, just check and ask. So when you're, you said you, you're not a Christian and you're not a Muslim either? No. Okay. no so in terms of your... So what about yourself? What's your name, sorry? Uh, William. William. What's your name? Uh, Preston. Preston Imran. Nice to meet you. So you said that um, you, you've done a lot of research. So in t in, you said you arrived at the fritter. Where did you? How did you get to arrive at the fritter? Well, the combination of things uh, here, talking to various Muslims, uh, reading, and um, I would always hear Muslims say when I was doing research and when I spoke to Muslims, they would say everyone is born a Muslim. And then I remember from Christianity talking about God creating man, Adam, Eve. And then God giving us free will, but then putting within us knowledge, which links us with the, the belief in the Creator. But then I hear about free will, and then we all stray away. So I'm like, are they working against each other, free will and the fit? Or are they one and the same? It's a great question. It's probably uh, uh, more than I can. Uh, I'll, try, I'll try my best to sort of try and give you my view on it. Um, so the fit just means natural inclination or a natural disposition. And what it is towards is the idea that there is a creator. That's the main part of this picture, that we, we are instinctively know that there is a creator. And alongside that we get some, from the picture we get also some basic concepts of morals. So we know killing is wrong, at least some of these things, they come automatically to us. What you would call your conscious, in the sense that when you're about to do something bad and you get that feeling, you know, this isn't right, I shouldn't do this. That's your picture rearing itself. Now, your fitra itself doesn't have any power as such over you. It doesn't, it's, just, it's just like a, a sixth sense almost, if you like. Yeah. But where, where it comes from, there's, there's different, lots of different explanations, but the one that I find sort of a little bit convincing is, initially, before when Adam was created, and before human beings were put onto the earth, all of the human beings that ever were going to be born were taken from, from Adam. And all that progeny was put before the creator. And the, the, the creator said, do you testify to us? Do, we, do you testify? This is pre-existence on here. Do you testify that I am the Lord? Are we are testified that you are our Lord. So that knowledge, that knowledge of the creator is innately then within us. It's, it's innate. Now, then, we're, then we have our, we're born on the earth. 
And it, you're born on the earth, you're born in different states. So I could be born into a Muslim family or a non-Muslim family, in a rich family or a poor family, or in a, or in a you know, in a, in, a, in a state where my last consideration is um, religion. So I could be you know, starving, suffering, other things like this. And or I could be in a state where I could be born in place of atheist family, and I'm from the beginning I'm sort of taught to disregard these myths and these stories. And what can happen over time is your fit right becomes clouded. Cloudy, yeah, yeah. 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 It's like the there's the sun, and then this cloud goes over the sun, and the sun is still there. Some of the light is coming through, but the clouds are a bit obscure the detail of it. And what what we try and do when we're having these discussions with people over time is we're trying to uncloud the fitra to work out what is it, why is this person not connecting with their creator and it's all about connection you're absolutely right why is this not happening and it's and it's many many reasons so some people have had some sort of traumatic experience they've lost a loved one and then they they maybe subconsciously blaming the creator for that or there's some other suffering has happened to them or they've seen suffering in the world like why are people starving and this is one of the common questions that makes people think well maybe the creator doesn't exist and but if you i mean you've come across you must have come across the studies that talk about if you look at children they will automatically look for agency or, or some sort of uh, thing that's controlling everything in the world. It's almost like they have an innate belief that I can't remember. I think it was a Cambridge study. I don't, I don't remember it, so I won't quote it. But this is, I think it's quite clear that this fitra exists. And it's really, it's really like a compass. It's designed to bring us back to that one God. But it can be easily clouded over. It can be clouded over. And, and really the, the whole point of life is to try and uncloud it. And that comes through research, through experience. Uh, you know, talking to people and then coming to that conclusion that A, the information I'm being given is accurate, I can trace it to a divine source, that the Creator exists and then you try and establish that connection with the Creator. And once you do, so we believe as Muslims that there, there's two types of guidance, two types of guidance. So one, one guidance is, uh, we call it Irshad, which is really what the messengers do. God has given them a message and they come and they give that message to you. So all the people here who are trying to talk to you about a specific religion, they're doing that type of guidance. They're saying, look, the Quran is like this, it's got this information in it, it tells you to do this. It it's called Irshad. 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 Yeah. The second type of guidance is once you come to that conclusion yourself, that yes, I accept that this is a, there is a creator and this information is from him, and then you believe that, God puts what we call faith in your heart. That's called Tawfiq. The, the guidance of Tawfiq. Tawfiq. And that's, that guidance is the one that when the, when the faith enters your heart, and then you become, essentially, you become a believer. Wait, so, so when the faith enters your heart, is that at the moment of creation, when Allah creates you, you get uh, Tawfiq? No, no, that's, sorry. You said that's by talking. That's right. Okay, sorry. So, once, so first is the information, accepting the information. Once you accept the information, then God essentially gives you the faith. It's having that faith in within you. And that's a process. So life is a process. So you're in the searching phase of that process. Yeah, I'm still searching. And you're going to get to a stage, hopefully, God willing, where you decide, okay, I believe this now. I accept it. I can't reasonably doubt this now. I believe. And then at that point, when you accept it, the Creator will put the faith in your heart. And so, and so the ultimately, we don't believe I can't change you. I don't believe that. It's going to come between, it's between you and your Lord. So your part of it is to be sincere to the information that's given to you and try and research that. And then that spiritual connection comes when you accept it internally. So I may not even know that you've accepted it. You know, I met a, I met a brother. He was 25 years old. He, he was, this was in the, what we wouldn't would that have been? In, in the, how old would he have been then? So I met him when he was 85. When he, 60 years prior, he goes, I was in India under British rule and I owned lots of land. And I would see my Muslim servants every now and then they'd go off and I knew, okay, they're going to pray. That's all I knew. I didn't regard their, I was looking down on them, but I didn't regard them as anything significant, didn't think their religion was important. 60 years later, he goes, no, let me, what will they do? Let me have a look. He's in a different stage of his life now. He's looked into this and 85 years old, he becomes a Muslim because of something you saw 60 years ago. So he, that's what, that was his journey. So everyone has their own journey. We're not, no one can make anyone become anything. All that, all that we can do is say, this is the information that's provided. And that's what you do. And the fitra is really, our discussions are really about trying to uncloud that fitra to let you establish your connection with your creator. That's our, that's our approach to it. So I don't know if that was... You know, no, well, that was helpful. I mean, I, I dragged my, my friend there. Okay. What do you, you feel about that? This are idea you a that, Christian or a... Uh, I don't subscribe to any religion. Any belief. Um, 
it's been a two journey, like yeah. what you're saying. Um, similar to a conversation we had last, I think the last week, or maybe a week before, when you were asking me, when I was saying you, I felt this inner drive towards a, a course of action, and you were asking me, what is that? Where does it come from? Where does it come from? I said, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so that's my take on that. I, it's a certain perspective on, on life that you can use. I mean, that's all I can say, really. Um, one thing I can say is about the, the... You mentioned something, a drive for people to see agency within things happening in the world. Um, you could take that multi- a multitude of ways. You could say it, it's uh, it's indicative of a creator, or like something that yeah. is just fine. Or you could look at it in a certain other angle, which is the one I might put forward, which is like this, is that... In our, in our past, most people's belief systems were animalistic, animism, about the natural world being full of other spirits and alive. And when something happened in the natural world, it would be considered an omen. Like if you tripped on a rock or if you saw a face in a mountain or you saw something in the cloud, people would infer meaning from that, uh, from the spirits, from the gods. And that is a way of looking at the world. Uh, uh, humans do this instinctively. They want to see agency within the world. And whether it actually has it or not, I don't know. Some people say yes, some people say no, but I don't know. Is that, it's, it's what you mentioned about instinctively. Yeah, that's it. Where is it coming from, though? That's the thing. Because we had that discussion, because we, we agreed on, yet yeah, the instinct is there. Yes. But it was trying to find out where it was coming from. Yes. And that was when I was then looking at what Muslims were saying about the fitra and what Christians were saying, and, and even, I think, some Buddhists. But it's like there's an origin for that instinct. Yes. And that's what I'm desperate to find out. I can give you a biologically reductive answer yeah. because it's probably not going to satisfy you. Let's hear that, will you? Well, there's a, there's a possibility. This is an idea that came to my mind. It's not my idea, but there's an idea. It's that the instinctive drive to see agency within the world is it really it, it can help your survival, right? And especially as when people when people do actions, we infer motivation, right? When somebody looks at you a certain way or somebody greets you in a certain way, we try to infer what's going on. There's a subtle dynamic, whether it's friendly, whether it's hostile, you know what I mean? If you meet somebody and you shake hands with them, they can look at you like they don't like you. And you can feel that. You're sensing agency from, a, from, from something you feel. There's a thing called am- anthropomorphization. Ah, got it. Well done. Where, yeah, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> it's where you look at a rock face and you see a face. This is the human brain looking for patterns. We look for patterns in the world and you say why? Because patterns allow us to infer cause. And if you can infer cause, you can plan the future. You can say, well I've seen that animal before. It's got red and black stripes. That means it's poisonous. I want to stay away from it. That's something like like a wasp or something or a snake or something like that. That inference of patterns can be equated to survival. That's a possible reductive solution. If you like it. For me, I I appreciate the reductive uh, explanation. But for me, when I see that, there's a, there's a few things about that that's interesting. When we try and explain instinct, we, we fall into sort of some difficulty. Because if you take a literally a day-old chick who's never had previous experience before, because you're talking about how experience leads us to find patterns. And if a, if a fox-like creature walks by, it knows to freeze and to duck. And they'll find cover. And you know, biologists say this is a this is an instinctive, hardwired instinct. But that's not an explanation, it's just putting a label on something that we don't know. We don't know why it's there or how it's there. But there, there is within that creature that innate knowledge that if I, this big shadow that's going by is going to be somehow dangerous and going to need to freeze. And you see that literally from day from, from the point of birth, they will do this. And this is a this is a natural instinct that is not based on experience or patterns because it's too early. I do have a I do have a little bit of knowledge of new science that would contradict that. Okay. Uh, my purpose here is not to just contradict your views. You no, believe whatever you want, man. It's not my business. No I just want to see if I can find another sort of and yeah, yeah, solution yeah. to something. Uh, just as a side note, my personal standpoint is that I don't know anything about the world, and I think there's far more things happening than I understand. So I'm, you probably have the same I, standpoint. I, I don't like take, making everything biologically reductive. I personally don't like doing it. Um, although some, I think a lot of the times it might be right. I think there's more going on in the world and reality than I understand. So I'm open to the possibilities of gods and creators also. Things. Absolutely. Now, there's a really interesting bit of science that's talking about genetic memory, about how they had rats and the... Oh God, I can't really remember it exactly, but it's that the offspring... The, 
they made the rats, ah, that was it. It was the smell of the flower, a flower from a tree. They put them in a cage, fish cage, and you put the smell of this flower, and then they electrocuted the floor. So they were getting pain associated with the memory of the smell of the flower. And then the rats had child, they had baby rats, and they had the same effect. They'd never been electrocuted, they'd never smelled it before, but it was meant to be passed down through their DNA. You're, it's really interesting because this can, this can account for genetic memory of people having a, a feeling of their ancestors or things that have happened before that they've never experienced that builds up our behavioral adaptation. It's really, really interesting. No, no, I really understand that. I think we it spoke about rule out, it two weeks ago. It doesn't rule out God, by the way. It's so genetic it's just, memory, as you right. said, yeah. which is fine. But then we then push forward and say, who is the designer? Oh, yeah. that genetic you, memory uh, within Right, you could say that if you like, yeah. You know, you know this idea of genetic memory, it's, it's really important that when these ideas are put forward that they come with a reasonable mechanism. So, as far as we know, memories or thoughts don't cause DNA changes. Well, this is the new science saying that it does. So that, that would be... Yeah. Where, where was that from? Because I've never... I heard it a few days ago. Um, okay. I can't quote it for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've heard it. Um, if you're interested, uh, we should look I'll, it up. I will look it up. It, look it's up. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, yeah. the, the reason I bring this forth is not to dis, not to yeah. deliberately discredit ideas of creator gods. It's just to put an explanation I don't, I don't think it really forward. changes. I think it might explain the, the chick. But it doesn't make, explain the, the fitter because this is, a, I think, something a bit more, bit bigger than that. Because you, because what we see, I mean, you talked about animism and these things in previous communities. Mm. But what this, what all this points to is that from as far back as we can go, even if you go back to culture, Neanderthal culture, which we're aware of now that existed, you see some sort of spiritual aspect to their culture but that we that we think is spiritual anyway. Yeah, right. But what that would tell you is that from the beginning, man has been God seeking. That's all it, for me, that's all it would say. It doesn't account for the, why the God seeking is there. And I would say that the Fitra is a good explanation for that. And, but this is all, this is all layered. So we're just, we're just taking the term from the Quran or from the Hadith and we're giving that an explanation to that. This is based on the previous discussion about establishing whether the Creator exists and the, verif the, you know, the verifiability of the Prophet Muhammad. Did he, was he sincere? Was he truthful about what he was saying? Oh right, yeah. And, and all of these things. And when you when you compile these things together, for me as a Muslim anyway, I come to because until I was about eighteen or nineteen, I was a Muslim because my mum and dad were Muslims. Yeah, right. But then I started to do my own reading and searching and finding, and then I established for myself, yeah, I accept this. And then I wasn't a Muslim because my parents were Muslim. You see similar journeys, not people from other religions. So Hamza, who's normally here, you know, he came from a, an atheist background and he established for himself that, yes, I accept this and I believe this. So our, our journeys are all different, but really you have, it, it's all based upon a layer of things that are right, make you arrive at a point. So oh, that's interesting. So free will wouldn't work against the picture. Not at all. Oh, that's interesting. In fact, it's your, in fact, if you think of any system where you're going to be morally judging a creature, right and wrong you have to give them some ability to make a choice so uh, if not a complete free will there must be some aspect of free will that they have for example we, I wish I could fly I can't fly so my, my free will is limited right but there are some things I can do I can choose to drink this alcohol or not choose to drink you know, at least whatever I might be doing so the free will is necessary for them to there to be a judgment that's, that's so, right I so, came to the same conclusion absolutely. myself so in our religion if you're the prophet peace was saying that the pen is lifted from three people. And what that means is that their deeds are not written down. The sleeper until he awakens, because you don't know what you're doing when you're sleeping. Um, the child until it reaches the age of understanding. So children are not held accountable for their actions. And the one who is not able to reason, so the insane. So even, imagine you get someone who's schizophrenic, who's hallucinating. For, for me, he may be in a better spiritual position than I am. Because he's not in an ability to make decisions that he can be judged upon. And I may have made loads of mistakes, do you understand? So these so we have to have moral culpability. Only only way we can have that is if we're free to make our choices. So the fitter is there, we have our free will, and then we have to interact with whichever circumstances that we're in. So depending on your circumstances, if you're if you come from a, a background where you know someone is teaching you and telling you this information, you get to a stage where actually there's no there's no other option for you to either accept the truth that you accept this, this is, or, and follow it or to reject it and you're judged according to that. If you're someone who's never heard of anything and all your all your all you know is whatever's in the picture, as long as you come to a reasonable conclusion that this tree is not God, you know, the sun isn't God, you know. 
you, you'll be judged according to your level of knowledge. So in the Quran there's a statement that says, we do not punish your people until we send them a message. We do not punish your people until we send them a message. So if the, messenger has, if the message hasn't come to you, you are not, you can't be held accountable for not following it. Really? Yeah. So, how, so we don't believe that there was only a line of Jewish prophets or the prophet or Arab prophets. We believe that every single nation throughout time has been sent messengers. The prophet told us 124,000 prophets. And they came to all the different They came to Africa, they came to China, they came to well, the Scotland Aborigines. as well. Yeah. <laughs> Even Scotland, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so everyone received the message. So, this is why when you go back and look at societies in history, they, all, they usually have an ultimate creator and then have sort of demi gods or sub. But, they, but there is this belief in an ultimate being, and that, that sort of it goes throughout all of the um, cultures yeah, that we've come across. Yeah, so you can see the hints of these messages from the past. We're just aware of a few of them, the last and the, the few that came before. So about 25 of them are mentioned, but there were thousands and thousands because we're all human beings. We're all, we believe, you know, equal in God's eyes. And we all deserve to be given the message. It shouldn't come by one specific race or people. Or, it shouldn't be that way. It should be given to everyone. So, you said that. Do you believe in a creator, William? You know? I can't say the word believe, I, I, and to be honest with myself. So, um, I'm not sure how I can say it very easily. I don't know. I don't know if there's a creator. That's all I can say. Uh, I'm not sure if it's more likely or less likely. It's not a very satisfying answer, I know, but that's the honest. How have you, how have you arrived at that sort of position? What, what sort of led to that? <clears throat> well, uh, I've had various experiences. You could call them spiritual experiences. Um, and in any case, looking at the complexity of the world and reality, I studied uh, as a biologist, and um, I know I'm very interested in philosophy. Uh, just under, trying to understand the, the, the mystery that's life. So the more I look into it, the more it seems perplexing in a certain sense. Like things get more and more complicated and I realize that there's more I don't understand. That's it. So I, I, I haven't had something really that said it's absolutely going to be that. It's more like I learn this, I learn I don't know that. You know what I mean? That's it. That's Those are the kind of conversations I've had with him. And another guy comes like searching, trying to get to a point, to the point of the so origin. For, so for me, I completely understand. You know, I have a similar sort of background as well. And the, the point with the point with the point with looking at something like biology is, we have to start with a point where life starts. We can't start from any other place, and then we can go through the. So it doesn't really answer the question of the bigger picture, of the universe, and everything else like that. So if you're looking for, for me, if you wanna if you wanna go back to get a reasonable answer of why we are here and why every, why is there something rather than nothing then really you have to go to sort of the, and looking at the cosmological picture because really we have to explain the, the universe what is it why is it how is it so science does the how and the what but really what we the question that religion comes with is the why is it and even the how is limited because we can only go by whatever is available within the universe either as a way, powers of observation or systems of thought that allow us to do that. As soon as you go beyond that, we're, we're lost. There's no real question. So the, to, to, the point to really explain is, why is the universe... How can we explain the universe being here? No, I don't think science has that answer. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I don't not, I'm not from that uh, position at all. It's so, It's metaphysical. Absolutely. So your interest in philosophy really probably helps. Oh yeah, well that's it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the next, for me it's the next level of analysis. Yeah. Like, First, you start with, the, for me, with the wonder of the natural world, yeah, yeah. and then you progress to the wonder of my perception of the natural world, and what's the origin of my perception? How can I perceive? And how, what's consciousness? What, why do I have opinions and wants and feelings? Why can I separate myself from that and look at it externally? At least I've been able to, which is very fortunate, I think. You know, it's really interesting. So, in, in philosophy, one of the really important things is about how you attribute value to things. So when I look at you, I look in your eyes, I can see this is a human being, caring, intelligent, purposeful, and, and that's just by that glance. For me, the idea that this is somehow an accident over just that's accumulated over the millions of years, it doesn't. With my picture, maybe it doesn't fit. I don't. I don't get that picture. When I look in my daughter's eyes, or or you know, I see a puppy, and I see how the, the you know the. I don't. I attribute value to that that creature, that being my daughter, to you, and I can't. In a, in a world where nothing really has any value, ultimately, because there's no 
transcendent being that gives it that value, we're left with sort of self-deluding ourselves by making values up. Like, yeah, I feel connected to you, so I'm going to give you value, but that's just for me. Someone else might think, well, I, you know, you're from this background, you're from this colour, I'm not going to regard you as being equal to me. So they, these are arbitrary. So we're, what the creator does is, so I'm looking, what the creator does is he gives us a way of anchoring our value outside of human, human sort of consciousness. And that's important because in history, if you go back to... Sorry, outside of human consciousness. Yeah, absolutely. So our, our, my values, my morals, they come, they transcend human society, I believe. Because they come from the creator. So if you, if you looked at Germany, for example, in the 1930s you know, and 40s, where Jews were being massacred, and anyone else, disabled people, black people, anyone who was an Aryan was being massacred, they, in a society, had decided that these people were not valued. Now, and because it was a social, their values and morals were socially constructed. And that's the danger with social construction. We're seeing it in China now, where a certain group of people are being, uh, you know, three million people in, in camps being annihilated as a social ethnic group, a religious group. As a Muslim, and in any Muslim, and I'm not saying that Muslims haven't done terrible things, definitely they would have, but they can't theologically justify it because why? We, our creator has told us point blank. I created you with Adam and Eve and made you into many tribes and people so you may come to know each other. You are all equal in my eyes, except for piety. Piety is like God consciousness, which is the journey you're on. It would have been, it would have been so easy if he had made the fitra so strong that the moment you were born, you would just prostrate and worship and you wouldn't have the, the free will to think of other things. Yeah. It would make things so much Absolutely. easier. Well, one of the uh, interesting things I think Hamza Zorsi has touched on which was quite telling about the fitra, which is that the fitra is indeed pure, and it is indeed seeking the connection to its creator. But the fitra becomes clouded with the dunya, the, the, the earthly uh, life and desires. And the more we are connected to the, the life of this world, i.e. materialism, you know, our own desires, the, the, cloud, the more clouded the fitra becomes. And then perhaps something happens in your life that can in all of a sudden uncloud that fitra. So for example, you know, if you're on a plane and the, and the captain says, we've lost all the engines, the wings have fallen off, you know, that's it, we're done. I'm sorry, but there's no hope. Suddenly that fitra that was clouded with this dunya, with this <laughs> earthly desires, earthly satisfactions, etc. Et it's suddenly unclouded and your connection is immediate to the one that sent you, that created you. And then you turn to Allah or to God and say, oh, if there's a God out there, save me, please. That's the unclouding of the fitrah. That's the unclouding. See? And how you uncloud the fitrah is by learning about the creator, connecting to the creator, observing what the creator sent you for, and connecting to those that he sent the messengers of God, and that will uncloud that fitra. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very, very, very good advice. Yeah. And I can't deny, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly interested in talking to Muslims, Christians, Buddhists, because I'm searching, I'm even talking to people who are not connected to religions, and we're trying to find scientifically what's the origin, what's going on. I don't think this journey will end for me. I feel there's a lot of information and hope that I'm getting when I speak to, to various religious people. And, um, right. Let me suggest a proposition. Maybe it's more valuable for searching than the goal. Oh, no, that's too depressing. No, it's not. No, no, it's not. Obviously, I don't know the, I don't know your mind. Because I want the goal. I would disagree with you there. I want the I goal. <laughs> and the reason why I would disagree with you is that that would depend upon the goal. If searching is just for the sake of searching with no ultimate goal, i.e. goal of eternal bliss and paradise, then I would agree with this brother. Oh, that's scary. Though. That, that, have the, that. that have the journey and don't expect the journey to end and continue with the journey. But I would suggest that if, if, and I say if, this paradise does exist, this promise of God is true, then I would suggest humbly that embark on this journey 
and accelerate on this journey with the intention to reach the goal. I want to reach the goal. I want, to, I want it to end. I don't want to keep doing it forever. And ever. What's the goal? The goal is to understand why do I exist? Why do I have the emotions that I have? Why do I have the opinions that I have? Value. Why does everything here exist? That The thing you mentioned earlier, consciousness. Where does it come from? I can't just accept that it's just accidental. It must be from somewhere. So the journey has to have an end, a goal. There has to be an end game for me, personally. I, I don't want to just... The journey is interesting, but I'm learning because I'm going to be talking to Buddhists as well, but I need to find the end. Very interesting. Why you? Let me, let me present an alternate perspective. Would you be satisfied with the answer? I don't know. Because I can look at it from my my perspective. The searching, the wandering, the fascination is very stimulating for me. I don't have that in that. In, maybe I, I don't have I don't have an answer. I don't have the answer. But it, the searching for me is valuable. Maybe for you, you have different feelings. No, the searching is valuable like me, but there has to be an end. But I would suggest for you, will there be an end? Uh, I'll touch on that. Um, I've had spiritual experiences. I've had intimations about what I've seen. And I, want, I don't think this is the only way of living. I think there's another. I think there's other realms of existence, right? But that's a whole other can of worms, right? But present it like this: you've got awareness now. We're aware that we're alive. We're aware that we're thinking. Now imagine for a second that on the point of death, your awareness ceases to be. Then you are no longer aware of being aware. Therefore, you should not fear death. Because you've got no wants, you've got no desires. You don't want bliss, you're not scared of agony, it's just, it's gone. That's a potentiality. Obviously in the religious spectrum, it's not like that. They have heaven and hell and such. But in another way of looking at it, it might be one when you reach death. That's it. You have nothing to worry about. It's, it's non-awareness. So the searching will end there. Perhaps. But I don't I, actually think that's the case. I don't think that's the case. But it's, an, it's a possible answer. But you know... Imagine, I'm going to give an analogy to, of the searching without a goal. So if somebody, imagine you're a prospector and you're digging, and, and your prospectors dig for gold. And someone said to you, look, if you dig over here, you'll find a rich rain of gold and you'll be, you know, you'll be rich beyond your dreams. And, and you say, you know what, I'm not interested in getting the gold. gold. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go over there, even though there's nothing to be found there, but I'm going to dig for the rest of my life. I think one thing is one is purposeless and one is purposeful. And and I think what any inquiry you make, we should do it with a means to an end. Because the journey is means and we have to get to an end. What we're, what we're to, and make it a good means. I mean we're not told we're told that the end does not justify the means. You can't do anything bad to get to a good goal. You have to do it in the right way. I believe that. Absolutely. So that's that's in a reasonable moral position to take. Many people don't. <laughs> Absolutely. So to so, so digging and searching it means that you're searching for something. Searching for the sake of searching actually means there's you're not searching. You're just that's right. a way of looking at it. Absolutely. So because you negate the you negate because you negate the word even <laughs> because you're not because you're not actually there's no end point. You're not actually going to find anything. So searching isn't the right word. It's almost like passing your time. I'm scared though when you guys mentioned that. Yeah. Could I be sub? I hope. Pray I am not subconsciously just searching for the sake of searching. I don't. I don't want to be doing that. No. I genuinely want to get to the end of this. So the other proposition that you gave was your consciousness could end and that could be it. Yeah, right. Mm. But what's the flip side? So if you lived your life and when you die your consciousness ceases and there's nothing beyond that, then it, it doesn't matter what you did in your life really. Ultimately there's no value in anything. Whether you were good, whether you were bad, whether you looked up. There's a counterpoint. Um, you, the actions that you do in life, you will imagine will have an effect after your death. So if you live a good life, it might affect people that you cared about in life, and their life will continue to be better because of that. Sure. So you could look at it that way. Um, but, but then ultimately, again, ultimately they will die as well, and whatever they experienced or not would again be uh, uh, unvaluable or have no real meaning. So w whether I mistreat somebody who then goes on to have a miserable life, and also their consciousness ceases when they die, my mistreating them and their bad experience would actually have no impact upon ultimately anything. Because, I sure, I understand. I'm just making the the, big, the point that I'm making is if you to remove God from the equation, 
actually remove you remove all morality, ultimate morality, you remove all or objective morality they call it, or you remove all ultimate value that we would place in things. Because it's just arbitrary, it's just temporary, it's just temporal. Now the flip side of that idea is when you die, your consciousness doesn't cease. And it continues. And it continues at ad infinitum, so it goes on forever. Your consciousness will continue even after you're after you're dead. So